to welcome you to today's inaugural New York Jewish Book Festival. This event is on what makes a Jewish cookbook Jewish with Kim Kushner and Liza Schoenfein. We hope you will explore the 32 events that are happening throughout the museum today, meet some of the 85 speakers, and get books signed at one of the 72 author signings in our main lobby and events hall on the second floor. While you are here, we also encourage you to take the time to visit our exhibitions, The Holocaust, What Hate Can Do, on the main level, and Survivors' Faces of Life After the Holocaust, photographs by Martin Schuller on the third floor. Andy Goldsworthy's Garden of Stones is also worth a visit, just outside of our wonderful Cafe Locks. The whole museum is open to you today. You can also pick up holiday gifts and books at the Pickman Museum shop and visitor services on the main level. We are encouraging people to wear masks in the museum, and we hope you will share feedback with us in our post-festival survey, which will be in your inboxes tomorrow. This program is made possible in part by support from the Battery Park City Authority. Your donations also help us present these programs. And now I'm glad to introduce you to our speakers. Kim Kushner is a culinary educator and the author of four best-selling cookbooks, including The Modern Table, Kosher Recipes for Everyday Gathering. A graduate of the Institute of Culinary Education in Manhattan, she has developed recipes for food and wine and chili pepper magazines, and has worked as a private chef. In 2005, she launched Kim Kushner Cuisine and now travels the world teaching her wildly popular cooking classes. Kim has appeared on the Today Show and has been featured in the New York Times International Edition, Huffington Post, Savour, and the Chicago Tribune, and is recognized as a leader in redefining kosher cuisine. Her cookbooks feature everyday recipes for delicious and artful dishes made from accessible seasonal ingredients. Liza Schoenfein is a longtime food writer, ed editor, and recipe developer, and author of the blog Life death and dinner. She is a frequent contributor to the food section of The Forward, where she was the food editor for several years. She was editor-in-chief of Jewish Living Magazine and executive editor of Savour, and has contributed to publications including Civil Eats, Cooking Light, Elle, Epicurious, Fitness, Rachel Ray, and Savour. She splits her time between Manhattan and the Hudson Valley. The Modern Table, Kosher Recipes for Everyday Gathering, is available for purchase in our Pickman Museum shop and lobby, and Kim will sign copies for half an hour after the event in the resource area in the events hall on the second floor. Now please welcome Kim Kushner and Liza Schoenfein. Hi, good morning. Hi, Kim. Hello, good morning, everyone. So I, I think you might notice if you looked at the... Um, the sort of billing for this event that there was supposed to be a panel of two cookbook authors. Leah Koenig, unfortunately, um, came down with coronavirus a few days ago. So it's no longer, we were, I was, I was supposed to moderate a panel, but now I think we'll just call it a talk, a conversation <laughs> between two people. Um, and we also will um, definitely take your questions at the end and maybe even get you to participate in the big question that we're asking today, which is, what makes a cookbook a Jewish cookbook? Um, so, Kim, um, you are the author of four decidedly Jewish cookbooks. Um, they are kosher cookbooks, and it says so right on the cover. Um, and so would you just, st I would love to hear uh, you tell us about the, what was your intention and you know goal with this latest one, but also with the others. I'd love to hear um, you just tell us what your thought sure. process was. Sure. Um, I was teaching cooking classes for many years. And at the end of every cooking class, the guests who attended would say, um, I, would, I would give them a little handout with the recipes. And they would always say, don't you have a book? Why don't you put the recipes in the book? So after years of teaching cooking classes, I decided, you know what, I'm going to start working on a book. Now, I happen to have grown up eating kosher food. I've always been kosher. It's not something that I've given much thought to. It's I'm, I'm totally fine, content, satisfied being kosher. I never felt like I was missing out. When I went to culinary school, in fact, um, I cooked all the recipes, but I didn't taste all of the recipes, and my um, fellow students would always joke because my food was seasoned 
always better than anyone else's who could taste theirs. And um, I just, it's just the way I've always been. And so when I started te teaching cooking classes, although I didn't really publicize them as kosher, they were just healthy, um, seasonal, fresh, simple recipes. They happened to be kosher. And that was the same approach that I wanted to take with my cookbook. I wanted to write um, a cookbook that was beautiful and had simple recipes and featured seasonal, fresh, accessible ingredients that happened to be kosher. I didn't want to write a kosher cookbook that happened to be great. I wanted to write a great cookbook that happened to be kosher. And at that time, almost 10, 11 years ago, Yes, there were many kosher cookbooks out there, and so many of them are wonderful, but I never felt that they um, were at the same level as some of the glossy, beautiful, non-kosher cookbooks that were available out there. The recipes were great, but a lot of times the photography was compromised or uh, the style of the food was very old-fashioned. So that's really how this adventure started. And um, one of the things that I've noticed about your books, certainly the last two, um, is that there really aren't recipes that are, you, if you flip through and you haven't paid attention and seen that, you know, the, this one is called the modern table, that doesn't immediately say Jewish or kosher, and then it just says in fine print, not so fine, but kosher recipes for everyday gatherings. But if you, if you didn't see that and you flip through, you're not seeing Jewish recipes. I mean, they're, they don't seem to be true. They're certainly not traditional Ashkenazi, and you're not Ashkenazi. But, you know, because I think when people think of Jewish food, a lot of people, the first thing they think of is matzo ball soup, brisket, uh, gefilte fish, Ashkenazi food. And I think, well, I'd love to talk more about that in a second. But what, um, what I was going to say is, you, you know, you flip through and it, there's international dishes. There's um, just, as you say, beautiful, fresh, modern dishes. So have you ever thought, um, maybe I should throw, um, you know, something, a cholent or some, I don't know, in there? Um, so for me, I haven't, I, I haven't because that's not the way I cook. So for me, the purpose was really to write a cookbook featuring recipes that I really cook in and out of my home. And so because those aren't necessarily the type of recipes I cook, um, I didn't include them and have not thought to include them. It was more for me about sort of redefining what kosher recipes can be. And what I've learned over the years is that there really is a fine line and there really is confusion between this idea of Jewish food and kosher food. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people assume that kosher food is Jewish food. And what I like to explain and when I talk to people is that kosher is um, a style, a dietary, you know, it's a set of dietary laws. So it is um, a a uh, it's not a cuisine, it is a, a type of a diet, really. So sort of like if you would say vegan or gluten-free, kosher um, refers to a set of dietary laws, things you can eat, things you cannot eat. Whereas Jewish cuisine refers to, I mean, it could be so many things, that's what Absolutely. we're here talking yeah. about, but Jewish cuisine is really a style of food and cooking and recipes and eating. Right, and of course, I, I already mentioned the difference between Ashka, well, Ashkenazi being one kind. Right. But would you tell me th about the food that you grew up eating, about your your you know cultural background sure. and you know the food you grew up yes. eating? Yes, I grew up in Montreal, Canada, and my mom is born in Morocco, and she then moved to Israel, and then she immigrated to Montreal, Canada, where she met my father, who's an Ashkenazi Jew, second generation Canadian. Uh, my mother is a wonderful cook, and I grew up eating traditional Moroccan food, but my mother was always very modern, and so she always also tried to learn from the Ashkenazi um, cuisine. So. On Friday nights, for example, we would begin the meal with tons of Moroccan small salads, and then we would have a matzo ball soup, and then we would have a spicy Moroccan fish. Oh, so ideal. there was always a little bit of everything. That sounds great. And yeah. did she use cookbooks? Yes, she did do, use cookbooks. Do you remember any Yes, of the I do. Um, some of the most famous kosher cookbooks in Canada today come from Noreen Gillitz, mm -hmm. who was a wonderful cookbook author, Bonnie Stern, who is mm -hmm. just a classic Canadian Jewish um, cookbook author. And those were the books I remember, the bright yellow cookbook by Noreen Gillett, still in my mother's kitchen today. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's 
the cookbooks that she cooked from. That's, that's great. Mm -hmm. And um, any grandparent cooking or? Not no. really very much, not really very much. My mother did not grow up with her parents too much in her presence, so she didn't learn from them. And my father's parent, mother didn't cook too much either, so. Okay. Yeah. So um, I'll just say that my, uh, my, my grandparents my, were Ashkenazi, and my father's mother was from Hungary, um, and had emigrated to the United States in the early, in the, in the early 1920s. And um, she used a cookbook that I don't know if you guys have heard of called the Settlement Cookbook. And it was a major cookbook for uh, Eastern European immigrants. And it was kind of a guide to, and, it, and, it was, and the woman who wrote it was uh, Jewish, but fr from Milwaukee, and actually wrote it under the auspices of a, a settlement house in Milwaukee that was helping recent immigrants and mostly Jewish Eastern European immigrants, and it was kind of a, a, a lifestyle guide as much as a um, you know to, to, to how to assimilate into American culture. But and even though the author um, Lizzie Black Kander was Jewish, the cookbook is full of trafe. Like right. it's not it's not in any way a kosher cookbook, uh -huh. and and a lot of people who came in uh, at it, at that time really tried to assimilate so much that they weren't following kosher laws at all. So, um, but it was funny because my grandmother did keep loosely kosher. I mean, not, um, you know, I would say very like kosher style more. Mm -hmm. um, they ate in restaurant, in other restaurants and, you know, but, uh, but she, this, she loved this cookbook. Right. And um, yeah, and then my mother like taught herself to cook from Julia Child, not, <laughs> not, not Jewish cookbook. Yeah. But I, I mentioned the settlement cookbook because I think it's a good lead in to our question of what makes a cookbook Jewish, because I do think that that cookbook was on the shelves of so many Jewish people of the that generation and of like in the in the mid in the early and mid um, and even later 20th century. So um, so let's ask this question: What makes a Jewish cookbook Jewish? Um, is it a Jewish author? I'll throw out a few things and then let's mm -hmm. go back. So mm -hmm. it could be: Is it a Jewish author? Is it that the recipes? Are, have traditional Jewish dishes in them? Is it that just it, that it's kosher? I mean, I think if it's kosher, it's certainly a Jewish cookbook. I think we can kind of say yes. yes. I, I would agree with that. Um, and you know, what if, or it, maybe it, you know, it's a Jewish author, and and the recipes are a mix of things, but it has what you. Sometimes I I read a cookbook. I review cookbooks all the time. Uh, especially Jewish cookbooks for the foreword, um, or cookbooks by Jewish authors for the foreword. Um, because I'll get cookbooks that are by, you know, they, I, they send them to me, and I look at each one and think, is this a good fit for the foreword? And frankly, well, the foreword also is, a, you know, pretty progressive and not necessarily, you know, it, it's kind of for mostly Jewish people, but it spans all the, you know, denominations and everything. But so I will write about, write about a book by a Jewish author, even if it doesn't seem like specifically Jewish, but it has a Jewish sensibility. Like for example, Dory Greenspan, the wonderful baker. Um, she always throws in like arugula, a babka, and they're the best, I've made them. And they're not the best, I mean, but you know, that they're but they're wonderful. But then she also has a tartatin, French, you know, and, and it's most a lot of French stuff and all different kinds of baked stuff. But I consider Dory's cookbooks to feel Jewish. And I, I but so um, I totally agree. Think? I think she is a New York Jewish recognized woman. <laughs> like and I totally agree. I, do, I think it's just about, you know, I was thinking about this question, and I think Judaism, it's not just about cookbooks. Like, your, your question is a good question to reflect upon in general when it comes to Judaism. And the way that I see it is that this is a very, I, I joke around with my husband, this is a very a la carte religion. We can pick and choose what works for us, what doesn't work for us, and that's what many of us do. And I think much in the same way when it comes to a Jewish cookbook, it's very a la carte. It could mean a lot of different things. It could be somebody like Dory who is, you know, a, for me, she's like a Jewish New York woman. And, 
yes, her, that is, if I'm going to look up a Rogelach recipe, it's probably going to be hers. Um, so totally, that feels for me like a Jewish cookbook. Ina Garden, somebody else. Her cookbooks have many recipes that are not kosher. I keep kosher. I have all of her cook all of her cookbooks and I pick and choose those recipes that I like and her brisket is the best and you know things like that. It feels very Jewish to me. You know, I think if somebody wrote a cookbook titled, you know, Shabbat dinners and every recipe every um, page was a different recipe that could be cooked, maybe a recipe from different culture, a different background, even if it had nothing to do with Shabbat, and that title was Shabbat Dinners, that would make it a Jewish cookbook. Right. Um, and, you know, there is so such a rich culture in the recipes, in Jewish recipes from all around the world. So we think of Jewish cuisine as a very Eastern European, that is the misconception right, that it's right. matzah ball soup and it's, you know, Knedelach and, and that sort of a thing. But if you look into every Jewish culture that exists, they have their particular foods that Absolutely. were brought, you know, brought along. And you have, you know, stews created, overnight stews, or things that were thrown together at, you know, low cost potatoes, meats. Um, this is part of our very rich culture. And that's what I love about it in general, but I think there's a lot to learn. You learn so much about the culture by learning about the food. Absolutely, and we should say, I mean, maybe a little bit more about, you know, there's Ashkenazi type food that we've talked about. There's, bless you, Sephardic cuisine that, you know, Spanish influence, Moorish, you know, and then the di diaspora from there, and Mizrahi, which is more from the Arab nations. And um, I guess the Levant is also considered Mizrahi, not, um, yeah, not uh, Sephardic, but although I think there's some crossover. Mm -hmm. um, so these foods are so, as you say, so broad, so different. And, you know, someone like Claudia Rodin, who writes about Mediterranean food, who writes about Middle Eastern food, and who wrote the great, the Jewish, the, the book of Jewish food. It's one of, uh, one of my favorite references. Every recipe, there's, I don't know if you know this cookbook, but every recipe has a long introductory paragraph that gives you the history and um, you know, the, the background of the dish, um, where, you know, uh, just the influences, the movement, because we have such a diaspora, you know, that it, things traveled. And she's so great at, uh, at illuminating all of that for us. And that, you know, and then her other cookbooks aren't necessarily Jewish, but I still think of them as Jewish cookbooks. I agree. I had her name written down as well. Uh -huh. I think she's definitely a pioneer in the yeah. Jewish food world um, as well. I actually brought with me, so um, this is a book my mother had in her kitchen. It's uh, written by a French Moroccan um, woman who, this was like consider the first Moroccan Jewish cookbook. I have never seen the actual cookbook. All I know is that many, many Moroccan Jewish households have the photocopied version. Nobody has ever seen What's the it actual. Called? It's called Saveur de mon enfance, which is the flavors of my childhood. And it's, there's no real recipes. It's ingredients and then like mix together, put in the oven and cook. No, no, um, no measurements, no temperatures. Um, and there isn't much writing. It doesn't speak much about tradition or religion or anything. It's just a list of basic recipes. Oh, um, and so I think this is a great example of something that um, really, you know, when we talk about Jewish cuisine and what it means, it's just about passing, you know, I think it's about celebrating and honoring um, the culture in some way or another. Big, small, it doesn't matter, mm -hmm. but um, there are different ways of doing it, and you know this is an extreme example. And then you can talk about cookbooks like um, Ina Gardens Absolutely. or Dory Greenspan's that are not specifically Jewish kosher or anything like that, but they still have a very Jewish feel to them. Yes. I'm glad you mentioned, uh, that's fabulous by the way, I'm, I'm glad that you mentioned that, that it's about celebrating the culture because your cookbooks in particular have an emphasis on entertaining, bringing people together, celebrating everyday gatherings, as in your subtitle. So 
any kind of celebrations and gatherings. And I'd, so I'd like to get back to your cookbook for a minute. And because I really enjoyed in this cookbook in particular, the emphasis on um, how to kind of Make, first of all, how to how to celebrate all these different occasions, and you do these great, you, you know, boards. Not just a uh, cheese board, but all these like the uh, uh, well, a dessert board or a mm -hmm. burger board, and also you you show. Uh, be with beautiful photography, which I think you do yourself, yeah? No. No? Oh. I wish I could say right. I did, but no. <laughs> oh, well. <laughs> Just take the credit. Uh -huh. no. <laughs> um, but can you talk about, uh, because it, because it's a very, again, Jewish sensibility, but nothing, you know, so t talk about your approach to that and also, while we're at it, your the other thing that I think is so special about this book is you really emphasize making it fun and easy on the host. Right. So I love entertaining. I love welcoming people into my home. And I also like just sitting around the table with my immediate family equally. Um, I found that through speaking to so many people, when it came to Jewish holidays or big celebrations, it was um, very stress-inducing. People would get stressed out about preparing these meals. They feel that it's very pressured. And so I wanted to write cookbooks that showed that just because it's you know, the Jewish New Year doesn't mean that you have to pull out recipes that you've never cooked before that have a hundred steps to them. You can make what you make every week or you can make what you make every week and elevate it. And so my goal was to um, compile recipes that were simple and straightforward but elevated at the same time. And so because I love celebrating any occasion, but I think the Jewish holidays are a great way also to celebrate our tradition, celebrate our Judaism, and also have a beautiful dinner party. You know, I can have a dinner party any night of the week, but if I can tie a holiday into it and, um, you know, tap into my culture, my heritage, Luckily, my we background. Have enough of yes, them. We, <laughs> we certainly do. Um, so I think it's even a greater opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I tried to do in this cookbook. This book, The Modern Table, I wrote during COVID when we were all really locked up and I was so excited about welcoming people back in. And there's a lot of tips and tools and ideas and suggestions for gathering people around the table. Because what I realized is, you know, people always um, just assume that I love cooking. I don't think anybody loves you know, slaving in a kitchen for days on end. It's not that part of it. It's, it's hard work like anything else you, you work hard on. You know, cooking, preparing for a large group, it's, it's a lot of work. But for me, the part that I really love is when we're finally sitting around the table and gathered and watching everyone enjoy and connect and there's delicious food and there's great drinks and there's good conversation. It just brings people together and it's no surprise the expression breaking bread is one that is very popular because that's really what it is about. Absolutely. And I just want to point out things like in this book you'll see serving elements and there are you can, it's a little small but there are there are six really cool things that I hadn't thought of like putting your beautiful greens in vases and having them be part of the um, you know, tablescape mm -hmm. and putting things in those brown paper bags and then having them spilling out like a cornucopia on the table. So serving elements and you do, you actually have like designing a tablescape on another page and um, it's, it's really helpful and inspiring. Um, yeah. Thank you. No, that's what this book is meant to be. It's just meant to be a takeoff point, inspiration for you to do it at home. Um, not everybody has the luxury of time or space, but I still think even with minimal supplies, you could create a beautiful meal. And just in the same way that I believe you eat with your eyes first, I think when you create a beautiful environment, a beautiful setting, it just enhances the experience even more. Yeah, absolutely. And you said you wrote this during COVID, and I know one of the things that struck me was post-COVID, having people over again, I don't know about you, but it feels a little bit more, I, I entertained all the time, and I stopped, you know, as we all did, and it became, it feels a little bit more daunting now. I, I don't know, we lost, we're uh, out of practice, and so this cookbook helped kind of ease me back in a little, you know, it's like, it, 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 such good ideas, but easy. And right. like, you know, and just f trying to have an easier, more easygoing approach 
I mean, as we learn, things change all the time with COVID. You might have, you know, you might be planning a party and then right. a few people can't come or, you know, whatever. Or, or You just have to be able to move more quickly mm -hmm. and not stress so much about it because there's enough to stress about. Exactly. So that's, that's helpful. That's exactly right. Um, so, I, you know, I kind of thought we should, I think we have plenty of time. So, uh, yes, we have plenty of time. Okay. Um, so, I wanted to talk about a few other kind of cookbooks um, that kind of wondering whether they are considered Jewish cookbooks or not. Like Yotam Atalengi, who is from, from Israel in London with his beautiful restaurants and really helped with his gorgeous cookbooks, Jerusalem and Plenty and all of those, um, bring uh, that uh, Israeli sensibility, that Israeli food to, into the mainstream here and around the world. Um, and I think he started it and then Israeli food became very, very popular here and not just in New York, but all over the country. I'm seeing Israeli restaurants popping up and more Israeli cookbooks like from our dear friend Adina, the Sababa cookbook. Um, but his, you know, his cookbooks aren't, cons I mean, Jerusalem is partly a Jewish cookbook, but he did it with a partner who uh, is an Arab, who is an, okay. no, no, actually, yeah, he grew up in Israel, though. I think he's an Arab Israeli. He's an Arab Israeli. Yeah, no, he is gay. Okay, I thought he was an Arab Israeli, but he... His nationality is possible. He's Israeli, his ethnic identity... I see. He's never European, but he was... In this context, they were Jewish. Okay. Well, so, and the beauty is that they grew up the same age in the same city um, because uh, Sa Sami Tamimi, Tamimi mm -hmm. grew up in East Jerusalem, I believe. Mm -hmm. And um, so the cookbook is his recipes and what they were doing was saying how much they shared and th that the foods overlapped and that they both, you know, and, and anyway. So that's the most Jewish of his cookbooks, but it's mm -hmm. not a Jewish cookbook. Right. Um, and then plenty is great for everybody because it's vegetarian mm -hmm. and plenty more. So anybody, you know, it's perfect if you're if you're kosher. Um, so that's one that I, I certainly think almost all his cookbooks are could be considered Jewish, mm -hmm. even though I'm sure that they some of them have you know are, are not kosher. Okay. Um, and what about you know who Molly Ye is? Um, so she's half Jewish, half Chinese. Uh, American and um, now lives way out in the Midwest mm -hmm. on a farm and has these great cookbooks and she does you know I don't I mean the, the most wonderful takes on her Jewish food and also Chinese and then putting it together I mean I, I consider her cook I always cover her cookbooks when she comes out with a new one and well, I guess she only has two but certainly feel Jewish to me mm -hmm. Um, even though I think she has like casseroles that have pork in them. Right, know. I think it's because she references her Judaism and she celebrates her Judaism mm -hmm. in her books. That's what allows them to be viewed as Jewish yes. if one wants to view them that way. Yes. Maybe it's just our perspective because we look for the Judaism in the books. Yes, yes. Maybe. Like I don't know if somebody else who, who might not be Jewish, would look through her books and think it's a Jewish book. Absolutely. But we connect with it somehow mm -hmm. that it feels that way to us. Mm -hmm. Yes, absolutely. Um, when you, if you were giving your kids a library of Jewish cookbooks mm -hmm. to get them started when they're out on their own when, in, in a number of years, right. um, what would be high on your list of cookbooks? So definitely uh, Claudia Rodin, mm -hmm. Noreen Gellitz, um, Bonnie Stern for sure, uh, Adina mm -hmm. definitely, Jay Cohen I think uh, his new his his book Jewish is a great. I wanted to talk about in, that. That's too. like a great book, especially for young cool um, people. That is a great introduction into Jewish cuisine. Shannon Sarna has a great uh -huh. book as well. Absolutely. Um, I think there's, I, I would mix it up with some of the older books. Like and then Joan some, Nathan. Right, Joan Nathan, of course. Mm -hmm. um, so I oh, would mix Leah it Oh, and Leah Koenig. Yes, of course. Yes. There's, there's, we have a lot of 
choice. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, um, Leah, who's not here, but I, I feel like I should, you know, mention her her work um, because she has written some very significant Jewish cookbooks that say Jewish. One is actually called the Jewish Cookbook, and it was I think Fiden, like a big yes. sort of almost encyclopedic cookbook that spans the world of Jewish food, um, and also and before that she wrote modern Jewish cooking, um, which was just her updated takes on, on a lot of traditional stuff, but also uh, also new stuff. Um, and, the, and they're terrific cookbooks and decidedly, unambiguously Jewish. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And she's written others too, but... Um, but yeah, no, I think those are, th those are a lot of good ones. I'm trying to think, I'm sure we're leaving out a ton. I'm sure we are, but I think Jake Cohen's cookbook is a oh, good one to talk, to talk about, about because it's exactly, does exactly what we're talking mm -hmm. about today, even the title, Jew-ish. Right. Um, you, you, do you know of that? So it's, are oh. you raising your hand? Gil, oh, oh yes. Gil Mark. You know, I'm surprised that I didn't think of him right away. Thank you so much because I, as a food writer, and I do a lot of culinary history, uh, Jewish culinary history in my articles, I refer to his, um, the Encyclopedia of Jewish Food w w at least once a month, if not more. And I just did um, a couple weeks ago. So thank you very much uh, for, for reminding me. And he also wrote um, the... Milk, the olive, uh, honey, and oh, yes. yes, but wonderful, wonderful. Um, yeah. Oh, that's right. Grossingers. That was the family with the Grossingers. Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, right. that's Chicken a, fat. That's a good yeah. one. Um, so I was thinking that we could talk a little bit about um, where Jewish cookbooks are. Oh, wait. Let's talk a little bit more about Jake. I keep, I don't know why, I, that was actually going to be one of the first things that I wanted to mention. So Jew-ish, so if you haven't seen it, it's Jew and then ish in italics. Um, and, it, he, and it's really fun, as you say. Um, and then something jumps out at you, which is that there's a recipe for challah croque monsieur, yes. which is basically a ham and cheese sandwich. Right. I mean, it, you know, and so, and he writes it next to the ham in the, in, in, in the ingredients list, sorry. Right. Um, but so, you know, so that actually leads me into this next uh, question, which is where Jewish cookbooks might be heading. Um, are, I think that you are kind of leading a trend, not a trend, but in, in a, you know, not a flash in a, the pan trend, but like leading the way in terms of a cookbook that doesn't necessarily, ha that the recipes aren't, as we say, a, either traditional Jewish or even just modern takes on traditional Jewish. Um, and so where cookbooks are heading, for example, one of the last cookbooks that I reviewed was Dini Klein um, has a cookbook called Prep and Rally, and the theme is cook for an hour and a half on Sunday, prep enough for four dishes, meals, for the week, and then you can just compile them during the week very quickly if you're, you know, working and don't have very much time to spend in the kitchen. And it's, um, there isn't a real Jewish recipe in there, and it's a lot of very vibrant, um, very family friendly. It's, you know, the idea is cook f when you have a fa family with young kids. Um, but I have to say the funny thing is that when I first received it, it, it's just called Prep and Rally. doesn't say anything about Jewish or kosher. I knew she was Jewish and, you know, uh, I, anyway, I flipped, the first time I flipped through, it didn't occur to me that it was a kosher cookbook. Right. It just, because nothing is missing, you know what I mean? It's like, if it, in, it, it used to, as you say, kosher cookbooks used to have, a, I don't know, a lot of them, some of them seem tired or... Um, and, and this vibrance and this, um, you know, she said, people who need to know it's kosher, no. And, you know, but, it, but part of it is to 
have a wider audience for your books. Right. So I think when I first started, I had a long conversation with my editor for my very first book, and it was, should we put kosher in the title or not? Because sometimes when the average person is in a bookstore, that was very back then when people really went to bookstores, um, and they would see kosher in the title, they might say, you know, I don't know. I don't, even if you're cook kosher, I might prefer to go for another book and modify. Um, and I think that that is what it was like then. But I really do think that, at least I could speak for the kosher world, which is the world that I'm part of, that things have changed and that this concept of kosher has been redefined. I think also we live in a time now where people respect uh, other people's dietary restrictions. There's so much that exists out there and it's actually on trend to be gluten-free and vegan and vegetarian and these restaurants are all taking off and the cookbooks are very popular that I think, believe it or not, I do think that kosher has sort of uh, come full circle and I think it's actually on trend right now and I think people are excited about it and I think there's been a wave of beautiful um, kosher cookbooks that are very different than the one the Grossinger's one that you mentioned mm -hmm. that now, you know, people, we know better. We live in a time where we know better, so we do better. So there's a nod to healthier eating, seasonal cooking, not using substitutes in the way we might have grown up eating with lots of margarine and, and you know, fake whipped cream and right. things like that. I was like going to say, remember Parv desserts right. where, like, how was it that it was hard to come up with these beautiful desserts where you don't, you're not substituting, all, you know, the, like you say, the, the dairy-free necessarily, mm -hmm. although actually dairy-free stuff has gotten so much better well, and so, so much wider. I think that's the thing now. We have access to ingredients that we didn't know about before, you know, coconut cream or um, there's so many vegan options that mm -hmm. are delicious and, and healthy for you that they're great to work with in the kitchen. So you can keep your desserts dairy-free, but if you even go into a non-kosher restaurant now and it's dessert time and you can ask, which of your desserts is dairy-free? There will always be one. Right. So, you know, it's sort of come full circle that what used to be looked down upon is now something that is celebrated and cool. Yeah, that's which is wonderful. Yeah. So I know your, your cookbook, um, your, The Modern Table, is new, but do you have, are you working on anything, or do you have any, any ideas or anything you want to share about what's coming next? I'm not, I am currently not working okay, on good. anything. Every time I publish a, a cookbook, I say, that's it, I'm done, I need a few years, um, but I'm really just enjoying this. The feedback has been great. Um, people are really enjoying it, and I'm enjoying um, going along the ride as well, oh. so for now, this is, this is where I stand. That's <laughs> wonderful, and do, do you cook pretty much every, every day? Yes. I cook almost every day. Usually Saturday nights, I'll, I'll serve leftovers for the kids. Mm -hmm. But and what are what which cookbooks just these days are you reaching for most? Um, I have actually Bonnie Stearns just published a new cookbook. If you haven't seen it, you should get your hands on it. It's called Don't Worry, Just Cook, and yeah. it is vibrant and beautiful and simple. I love that book. Um, I also cook from Persiana. I love it's a Persian mm -hmm. cookbook that is beautiful. Um, I'll revisit my old cookbooks. I have a lot of like Martha Stewart, old, old cookbooks that I love. Um, what else? Uh, I mean, there's so many. There are so many yeah. that I'll, I'll, I'll skim, I'll get inspiration, and then I'll go into my kitchen and play around a little bit and That's have great. fun with it. Yes. That's great. I'm looking at, I'm looking at the time because I want to open it up to questions, and I think we have about 15 minutes left. And so I want to ask you if you have any questions. But I would also like to, sorry, I think it's a small enough room that you can hear me even when I have the mic over here, but um, I'd like to open it up to you if anyone would like to finish the sentence, a, a cookbook is Jewish if, or a cookbook is Jewish because, like in, in, your, in your opinion, if, if you've had any thoughts uh, that are, you know, that you wanna share about uh, what makes a cookbook Jewish, I, I'd love to hear them. And, Yes. <laughs> That's a good point. No. Um, no, that's a good point. If it says, 
if it offers the PARV substitution. Um, anyone else? And I'll take questions too. Yes. So I'm going to take a little liberty and rephrase the question. Sure. Reunion? <laughs> oh. I'm sorry, it took me a minute. <laughs> That's great. I just, I, I don't know, from the look your face, you're familiar with it. Right? Yeah, um, it, yes. And then there's also one that, an, uh, one of, I think the first recipe editor of the foreword um, did in, a little bit later than that, so it wasn't the first, but um, I think it was based on reader recipes that she collected from forward readers and then came out with a book that's really interesting. It was actually a pretty revolutionary way of the Gershon Sepsis was a rabbi and a continuing teacher who published the book of Jewish recipes in the uh, 18th century. And it said that Thomas Jefferson cribbed his recipe for fried fish from Sepsis. <laughs> wow. In fact, if you look at Jefferson's cookbook, it's entitled Fried Fish in the Jewish Style. Oh, wow. That's really interesting. That's really interesting. In fact, I, I wrote an article about a new book by a, a culinary historian, an academic, um, about the first Jewish cookbooks ever, because there weren't Jewish cookbooks really in Europe. I mean, people people lived in family. They didn't really use cookbooks mm -hmm. at first, you know, for a long time. Um, but then there were a few, and it's very, I, I it, it's an article of mine in the forward. Right this minute, I can't remember the name of the author. Hmm? Oh, well, that she did the Sephardic. Oh, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, what a shame. Sephardi, which I wrote about. and. Oh, and that, I, that's a great book. I was actually looking through that book yesterday. Um, I was showing a friend. Um, Absolutely wonderful. Um, so yes, Sephardi by Helen Ja Pigne. Ja uh, so that would yeah, and that not only has recipes, Sephardic recipes, but really explains um, from the, the the how sort of Sephardic cooking, how it started in Spain when you know. The, the Inquisition, and it's very, it's very, very interesting. There's really good history in there, and how they used to, um, they, people used to be put on trial, and they have the trial records that she researched. Um, trial records of, they, people, servants and neighbors would turn people in. You know, you couldn't be Jewish, you, you could convert, and be, they called them conversos in, um, in Spain. And, but a lot of people in secret kept their Friday nights and um, holidays, and people would turn them in if they saw that they were dressing up on Friday night or that they were eating a particular food or, or buying a particular food um, because it, it was a giveaway that they were Jewish. And so it was, she was writing about how in the Inquisition, food was what got people in trouble. I mean, you know, and because you know so much about a person from their dietary and, and culinary and celebratory habits. Um, These so. are such, it's an amazing book and they're so important. I love when it goes beyond just the recipes and the mm -hmm. cooking and you, you get so much more out of them. I and learned it's really, so much. And you know, some people can pick up a textbook or an encyclopedia and they can learn from that and they can understand it. But for me personally, and for a lot of people that I know, um, you could connect and you could understand it on a different level. It's a more personal level when you read a book like the one you've just mentioned yes. because it's so relatable. Um, there's another book by um, a wonderful Syrian 
um, cookbook author titled The Aromas of oh, Aleppo. I love it. That is Kupa just, Dweck. yes, it's a beautiful book as well. And she really taps into this Syrian Jewish history. Um, and you, as you, first of all, it's a beautiful book, but I can, I can read it a hundred, I could flip through it a hundred times because it's so rich in history. And then she talks about the recipe. She, she talks about how she saw it made, how it's made today. She talks about her children, her grandparents, and that whole journey from then to now. And it's really spectacular. Absolutely, it's gorgeous. Mm -hmm. I love that book. Any other questions? Yes. I, I don't I don't I can't speak for all Sephardics, but I could speak for the Moroccan culture. I don't know why. I don't think they're able to put it into writing because you know, even when I'll call my mother or my aunt for a recipe, it won't. She won't even say, "Oh, it's a quarter of a cup." She'll be like, "Put some sugar in your hand, and you'll you'll feel it." And I'm like, "No, I won't feel it." Or you know, they'll say, "My mother, when when I was first married, my mother came to visit, and she brought like a suitcase full of pots, but they were like old." a handle missing, and she was like, these are the pots you have to use. And I'm like, no, I just got a shiny set of all clad. I'm, you know, I'm good. And, and it's true, I have these pots until today, and these are the ones that were carried on, and the flavors are better, and just everything cooks better in them. So I don't know why, um, but even, you know, they'll say it's a teacup full of sugar. Like that, those are the measurements that they used. You know, you, it's like a small teacup or, um, or the like. So in terms of, I, I would love, for a Moroccan cookbook to be written with actual measurements or to have like <laughs> video footage. That's, that's, that would be a dream of mine to do a, a, a video footage of, you know, real traditional Moroccan people cooking these recipes because that's the only way you could really know how to make it is to watch and learn and to feel and to experience it. Either. Either. Uh -huh. Either. <laughs> Right. Right. Exactly. That's. So once I decided, once I decide what I want the book to be about, what what the angle is, what the message is, what what I want to bring to the table, so to speak, um, then I I don't write the recipes for the book. The recipes exist. The book is written for the recipes that already exist. So I'll go back into my files and then yes, I'll adjust and I'll add or I'll say, you know, I'm missing this kind of chicken recipe and then I'll play around with it a little bit and I'll start developing the recipes, testing, testing again, sending it to taste te to recipe testers and taste testers. Um, and then we design. We decide, you know, what the overall look is going to be, what we want to get out of it, and then it goes into design, and then photography, and... For me, I love the creative process of creating the book. By the time the book is published already, I'm already like, <laughs> I've looked at it so many times. I love seeing the photos, deciding where everything is going to go. I love looking through and seeing what's missing, what should I add, what, what do I think. I love sharing it, the, initially the early stages, sharing it with others and getting that feedback because that's really where I get, I learn so much because my eyes are not enough. That's, that's enough for the way I cook and the way I entertain, but I like to hear the feedback from the other people as well. And then seeing the finished product, of course. That's a great answer. Anyone either have a question or want to try their, you know, take a stab at what makes a cookbook a Jewish cookbook? No more? Yes. No, no, go ahead. We're, we're, we're Jewish. We, we need to. Mentioned the garden before. What was wonderful? I picked up her last cookbook, and we're strictly kosher. And I, it was very little. Nothing. And then in the bakery section that I could uh, possibly make, it's not a Jewish cookbook. Right, OK. No, I. Full of, full of completely, you're not kosher things. I, I don't. 
No, absolutely. I get that. I mean, I think, you know, it's funny, like we're looking at the broad versus the narrow, you know, like uh, definitions of this. And I think the idea that something feels ha like it has a Jewish sensibility, but you know, I, I, I agree. I mean, it, it, and it's not to agree or disagree because this is not, you know, in any way a debate. It's totally whatever people are thinking and feeling. Yeah. Um, so, you know, I, I, I absolutely understand that, and um, and it is a shame that that the. Uh, yeah. Right. No, I. Right. Feel. Yeah. Yeah, and Ina, I don't think ever makes reference to being Jewish. No. So I, you know, I think it's also I told I agree with you. Yeah. I agree with yeah. you. I think sometimes there's also like a, a fine line between very New York and very Jewish, mm -hmm. and sometimes those lines get blurred. Somebody who is so New York, you just assume, you know. Right. Um, but I, I definitely yeah. see your point of view. Yes. From, from where, may I ask? I so I'm, I'm born in London, and yeah. my grandparents are uh, um, all from four different places. Ah, OK. Oh, OK. Um, but um, I guess I wanted to say from, from pure anthropology, not Jewish, but from an anthropology perspective, they talk about the very last thing that the culture before is assimilated to nothingness is the food. So what we're talking about is that kind of slow slide in Yeah. Yep. I'm really glad that you said what you said because it actually made me think about a point that I I think might even be a really good way to wrap up, which is that when you talk about food being the last sort of gasp of before um, a, a total assimilation, as a longtime food editor of Jewish publications and you know really a student of what's been happening over the past 10 years in Jewish or 13 years in in Jewish food and Jewish cooking Jewish cookbooks restaurants I feel that there's been a, a, a surge in um, new Jewish authors cookbooks chefs, Partly what I talked about before, the interest in Israeli food and food from, you know, and Sephardic Jewish food um, becoming much more popular and familiar. Um, but so many Jewish cookbooks and wonderful, wonderful new Jewish cookbooks with 
perspectives, that which, with these wide-ranging perspectives, they're coming out all the time. And I think that they weren't for a long time. I think that um, Jewish cookbooks were what we were talking about at the very beginning, you know, specifically kosher, specifically focusing on, on a, 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 a more of a limit, limited um, menu. Um, and now I think that, there, that this is actually uh, a very positive trend, again, using the word in a, in a positive way, um, toward um, spreading Jewish food in whatever form we want to, you know, define it or define it loosely, but that it's out there and it's, and we can buy a new Jewish cookbook, you know, every couple months. And I think that that's just really fantastic and I think there's a market for them and um, and I think that there's a lot of interest in them mm -hmm. and as you said even if you know you don't have to be Jewish to pick up these beautiful cookbooks and be very very happy that they're on your you know in your cookbook library so I think that yes And, it, and you have it here? Oh, oh if that's interesting to anybody, speak to the, you know, get together after the, um, after we're done, which, yes. Right. And a garden. I think there's a sensibility in the back of what she writes, but there's no purpose there. Mm -hmm. So intention. I think that that's a really um, a good way to look at it. I think that's you know definitely one way and a good way to to say if somebody intends for it to be a Jewish cookbook. But you know, as we said at the beginning, somebody like David Leibovitz is writing about. France or, or baking, but not Jewish at all. He's certainly Jewish, but you know, he, I don't think he intends for his books to be Jewish books, and they don't come across that way. I, I think in what you're saying, I do agree, but then I think about um, if somebody picked up an Ina Garden book, somebody who doesn't live a Jewish lifestyle, somebody who is not kosher, and they flip through and they come across a brisket recipe. And looking at that brisket recipe evokes some feeling of, wow, like that's something that reminds me of Judaism. I'm not saying that the book is a Jewish cookbook, but I think that it does have the ability to spark something um, in, in the person. So I think it's really about who the reader is. Like maybe is it the reader who decides or is it the author who decides? I don't, I don't know. I mean, for me, looking through an Ina Garden cookbook, my, I don't view it as a Jewish cookbook. I would look through it and say, what can I make and make kosher in my household? But, you know, when you come across a rogelach recipe or a brisket recipe, I don't know if, it has, if that recipe can, can, has the power to light something up in somebody. I don't know. I think it's fulfilling something, maybe not enough to classify it as a Jewish cookbook, but it still has some, some role of importance, I yeah. think. So I think somewhere between the author's intention and the reader's perspective is the answer, that it really is up to the individual. Um, but OK, I think we are, we are ready to finish up. So thank you very much for coming today. And thank you, Kim, thank so you. much. Thank you.